The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello and welcome to the July 2018 Pre-Hospital Care Research Forum Journal Club podcast. We hope everyone had a safe and enjoyable holiday and we thank you for joining us in this summer session of the Journal Club. The Pre-Hospital Care Research Forum is dedicated to the promotion, education, and dissemination of pre-hospital research. We believe that it is the responsibility of emergency medical professionals worldwide to build a body of evidence to examine pre-hospital emergency care. Here with the PCRF Journal Club, we take a closer look at some of the latest research happening in EMS. I'm Megan Corey, and I'm joined today by Dr. Bill Toon and Dr. Tony Fernandez. We're also joined by study author Dr. Shannon Fernando from the Department of Emergency Medicine at the University of Ottawa in Ontario, Canada. The study we'll be reviewing today is entitled Analysis of Bystander CPR Quality During Out-of-Hospital Cardiac Arrest Using Data Derived from Automated External Defibrillators, and this was published in the journal Resuscitation in May of this year. Now, this review is paired with an article written by doc, uh, columnist Dr. Tony Fernandez in EMS World called The Trip Report, Turning Research into Practice. We always encourage our listeners to check out this article at emsworld.com under the category of education and training. We also want to remind listeners about the call for abstract submissions. This is for clinical abstracts, and this is a second round deadline of July 31st, 2018, and this is for submissions to the EMS World Expo International Scientific Symposium, which will take place this fall in Nashville, Tennessee, and that's from October 29th through November 2nd. And once again, you have until July 31st, to submit those clinical abstracts through the PCRF abstract webpage. Thank you all for joining us today. So let's begin. And we want to remind listeners that you can use the chat feature on your screen to type in questions and comments, and we'll bring those into the conversation as we go. All right, a little background. We know sudden cardiac arrest, in particular out of hospital cardiac arrest, has been a major focus of research for many decades. I mean, when I started my uh, EMS career in 1985, the emphasis was really then on response times and airway management and uh, compression to ventilation ratio, if I remember right, was, Bill can remind me, of five to one or five to two, something like that. And there was really no emphasis on bystander interventions. Um, the, really, the initial interventions used uh, mouth-to-mouth ventilations. And as you can imagine, bystander participation was not very common and really uh, not expected. Research over the decades have changed this, and there's an increasing emphasis on uh, chest compressions. We know that from, you know, makes physiologic sense, right? You know, improving chest compressions uh, increases the coronary perfusion pressure, keeps that up there, cerebral perfusion pressure. Uh, so it, it makes physiologic sense, but it also um, has shown through the research uh, over the last couple of decades that the emphasis on chest compressions has improved patient outcomes. Uh, and there's a definition now of high quality chest compressions. I'm sure all you EMS folks are very familiar with this from all of your uh, BLS certification courses, 100 to 120 a minute, minimizing interruptions and a depth of five to six centimeters in adults. And then large studies have shown that bystander CPR and early AED use um, increases the likelihood of return of spontaneous circulation and improves uh, the likelihood of uh, a good neurologic outcome, which is really kind of the brass ring, what we're after. We also have uh, some good data on quality of CPR among healthcare professionals, but the same can't be um, said for bystander quality. Uh, so what is that bystander CPR quality? And there's our gap. And, you know, as we talk about um, EMS research and we start, you know, we, we'd like to pick apart what, what is it about uh, EMS research that we want to learn, you know, how do we design and, and how can we get more paramedics involved and EMTs for that matter involved in, in designing good quality research. We always uh, start with the background of what's been done on something already and then try to identify what are the areas that still need to be looked at. And this was the gap. So that leads to the research question, which is the what is the quality of CPR as performed by bystanders during the course of an out-of-hospital cardiac arrest? And that's what these researchers wanted to look at. And, you know, I was thinking about this. Um, when we teach research to our paramedic students, 
we start with the research question and we say, what is the research question? If you took this research question and you asked just a group of paramedic students or EMT students, what is the quality of CPR as performed by bystanders during the course of an out of hospital cardiac arrest? And you ask them, okay, now tell me, how would you go about measuring that? You probably come up with a dozen different designs. So a research question is the start and then you have to decide, okay, how are we gonna design a study to best address that question? So let's move to that then. What, uh, then that would be your methods. How are we gonna address this? So let me bring in Dr. Bill Toon um, to, uh, to uh, address that question. How, how did these authors um, go about designing a study that addressed the question of, of quality of CPR by bystanders in out of hospital cardiac arrest? Thank you, Megan, and uh, welcome everyone. Uh, as I always encourage you, if you haven't had an opportunity to actually read uh, this article, which appears in Resuscitation, the European Journal of Resuscitation, uh, I strongly encourage you to do it. And that's also a very good journal to monitor on a regular basis because it's just a chock full of uh, valuable pre-hospital care related research out of, from our European colleagues with plenty of uh, other international colleagues uh, publishing in it. So let's go ahead and discuss the, the methods that these uh, authors use. So this is a secondary analysis of a population-based uh, cardiac arrest database. And I think it's important for them to understand this. So this was not the purpose of the the um, original setting up of the database and what it was used to design, but they had this opportunity or this question was asked, hey, how can we go and find out a little bit more about it? And so in this case here, they, uh, they looked at uh, CPR process data. That is the electronic information that was captured by the, elect uh, by the AEDs that were utilized within the system. And then the particular system that they uh, were doing this, this was in the Ottawa Claritin region of Canada, A, eh? um, like that for my Canadian colleague there. Uh, so um, it's between July 1st, 2011 to July 1st, 2016. That's the time frame. There's a population of almost a million people and uh, there was, uh, and this was done with the Ottawa Paramedic Service, which uh, are local, located, their AEDs are located in city-owned public buildings. And there were 550 such AEDs in total. They also looked at uh, the police department. So I would imagine in, in addition to the public places, the AEDs are also in the police vehicles and available to them. So they use the Resuscitation Out Outcome Consortium Epistry uh, its database, and I would, again, if you've never gone to their website for the Resuscitations Outcome Consortium, you should. Uh, it's a shame that the funding has ended for this wonderful work that has come out of this group of people here over the years, And uh, but I do recommend you go through the website and see all of the information that they've done and uh, worked on over this time. So they looked at, um, they looked at this uh, population and they enrolled cases that uh, included individuals of all ages who experienced now the hospital cardiac arrest um, or CPR and this was CPR done not done by EMS personnel uh, this was CPR that was done by lay responders uh, in this system here and they included people who were not part of the formal EMS system were considered lay, re lay responders. So this included police, it could include healthcare professionals that were not part of the 911 system, in addition to the everyday uh, general uh, bystander. So they used uh, the data from the ROC database specific to the Ottawa Paramedic Services AED database. Patients were uh, 18 years of age and older, presumed cardiac etiology, and uh, bystanders, and again, uh, the official definition by Utstein is it's denoted as any person involved in the resuscitation who is not responding as part of the organized uh, emergency response system. And as it said, it did include on-duty uh, personnel. They included cases with a minimum of one minute of CPR process data available. 
is they considered cases of shorter duration typically represented those that were a shockable rhythm and more likely to achieve ROSC return to spontaneous circulation prior to any extensive CPR being done. And then they, what they did is they removed cases that were not cardiac in nature, cases that they didn't have data on. Um, traumatic cardiac arrest, I'll talk a little bit more about inclusion, exclusion criteria here in a minute. And then uh, the study was approved, it had an appropriate IRB approval from the Ottawa Health Services Network. So the AEDs used were the Zoll AED plus biphasic defibrillators. And I think it's important to understand what defibrillators are used because they collect their process data all differently. So this was actually, these devices are equipped with an accelerometer that the person actually, it's, it's a puck actually that's built into the defibrillator pads that actually help provide um, measurement of the information. And there's also audio feedback provided by these AEDs that talk to the rescuer about the quality of their CPR. And um, so they would get their typical kind of stuff. They'd apply it, they'd start CPR, they'd listen to the instructions that were taking place. And um, let me just look at a few other things here. It, they, their rescue net is their code review process software that they were able to utilize here. And they wanted to look at how well these uh, bystanders worked within the 2010 or 2015 uh, guidelines. So their overall outcome measure was the primary CPR quality uh, that was collected looking at the chest compression fraction. And the chest compression fraction is the proportion of time spent providing chest compressions during a given period of a resuscitation. What was the mean? compression rate, compression depth, and perishock pause, again, against the 2010 and 15 uh, guidelines. So they were able to look at that. So we're gonna go now, that's the overall methods, and Tony is gonna jump in and, and take us through the results of everything, and then we'll have our general discussion. Megan, do you have a question? Okay. Yeah, you know, before we uh, we go right into the results, there's so many things that you brought up I thought that were relevant and that Tony had put in the trip report too that he's reminding me I think we should really kind of, maybe we should bring in the author at this point so we can ask some of these questions. This is, uh, first of all, we want to congratulate the authors on this. This is a, a really important and uh, a very cool study because of a, a number of different things um, in the design, I think, too, and in the way that they uh, uh, described the population and, and exclusions. There's a number of, of, of different things we wanted to address in here. So let me just um, bring in and introduce Dr. Shannon Fernando, um, again from the Department of Emergency Medicine um, in uh, Ontario, Canada, and this is in Ottawa, University of Ottawa. Um, so Dr. Fernando, can you hear us okay? Yep, I can hear you. Thanks so much for having me, guys. Yeah, can you can you just spend a couple of minutes uh, introducing yourself and, and maybe your background, and then we can um, ask you a few questions about the methods and how you designed the study. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, thanks again for having me here. Uh, I'm, I'm sort of speaking on behalf of my co-authors, uh, Dr. Christian Bayancourt, uh, Dr. Ian Steele, and Stanley Morrow, one of our advanced care paramedics with the Ottawa Paramedic Services. Um, I am a, a PGY-5 or fifth year uh, resident uh, in emergency medicine and adult critical care medicine uh, at the University of Ottawa, fifth year of a sixth year program. Um, and uh, I completed a master's of science in research methods prior to my residency. Uh, my main research interests are basically, uh, in a broad sense, uh, the interaction between uh, the emergency department and the ICU, uh, largely out, uh, improving outcomes of critically ill patients, uh, improving disposition, uh, and uh, identifying patients who might uh, require critically critical care uh, early on in their emergency department stay. And so for that reason, cardiac arrest, uh, among several other things, are, are one of my major uh, interests. Um, this specific study, uh, I have to uh, give real significant credit here to uh, uh, one of our co-authors, Stanley Morrow, who's an advanced care paramedic uh, with the Ottawa Paramedic Services, who actually came up with the idea for this study. Um, what Stan uh, told us, actually, was that uh, in the, in the uh, city of Ottawa, and, and uh, Dr. Vianco and Dr. Steele are both you know, investigators with, the, with the, our Resuscitation Outcomes Consortium, Iraq, and they didn't know this either. But uh, when, an, it, when a cardiac arrest occurs in the city of Ottawa and an AED is utilized that's under the jurisdiction uh, of the Ottawa Paramedic Services, as Dr. Toon was saying, about 550 in the city of Ottawa, uh, that AED is taken to Ottawa Paramedic Service headquarters and the data is downloaded uh, and kept in a database. And they've been doing this apparently for many years and we actually had no idea 
uh, that they were doing that. Mm. And so uh, Stan just brought that up one day at our, on our meetings in kind of a whim and, you know, identifying the actual quality of CPR performed by bystanders, as, as was mentioned by Dr. Trude, uh, by Dr. Trude and Dr. Corey, is, is a, an immense, uh, un, important question uh, that we don't really have a good understanding of. We just know that the U, I, uh, bystander CPR quality is significantly associated with improved outcomes in the short term and the long term. Uh, and so it really, uh, that's, that's where the study came from. So it was really just a matter of synchronizing uh, the data that was obtained from the Resuscitation Outcome Consortium uh, that we had with the data that was in the Ottawa Paramedic Services AED uh, database. And once we, once we had the cases that we knew, we just matched them on the basis of date and time. Um, and uh, then we basically had associated AED data that uh, went along with uh, everything in the Resuscitation Outcomes Consortium database. So it worked out very nicely in that respect, and, and I'm very grateful uh, to Ottawa Paramedic Services because I spent several days over there. Uh, you know, they, they helped me. You know, utilize the database, get get all the data, and then using software to uh, to actually gather all of this data on uh, on uh, quality to give us kind of some of the first insight into actually how bystanders perform uh, CPR in a possible cardiac arrest. So I want to jump in there for a minute and uh, talk about a similar experience. So when I worked in uh, Johnson County, Kansas, one of my responsibilities was uh, our cardiac arrest registry. And the thing we worked very hard at was collecting the electronic data off of all of the AEDs and then matching it directly with the patient care report. And uh, as the electronic medical records came along, we were able to, at least if the device was compatible, we were able to mer merge data together. So we could go right from the AED to the attachment of the paramedic arrival of their device and collect uh, all the electronic data and look at one big um, story about what was going on with the resuscitation. Uh, we did run into some problems though, as many of the AEDs had uh, the synchronizing of their clocks were an issue. So we had to, um, that became a little bit of a, a challenge for us. And the reason we got into doing this so vigorously is the cardiologist at the hospital, when a patient came in and was sitting up and talking to them, didn't believe that they had been in V-fib. And mm -hmm. so we needed to collect this stuff to provide evidence to them that, yes, here is the initial rhythm that the bystanders uh, had when they deployed their AED, because in many cases they were questioning uh, everything about the devices and stuff. So uh, we did that. Uh, for every AD, the only thing that we did differently is our supervisors, our battalion chiefs that were in the field, carried several extra AEDs with them. And what they would do is they would exchange an AED with the agency, whether it be a police, bystander, or whatever. And then uh, they, in many cases, they could do the download themselves. And when they had a complicated one, they would return it to the office, and I would be able to uh, to get the downloaded information information off of that. So it can be a very onerous process, and I'm not mm -hmm. sure many agencies go to that extent. But our rationale for going to that extent is because the physicians at the hospital did not believe the patient was defibrillated and they were in a shockable rhythm. I think this also emphasizes the importance of having, um, you know, standardized measures and agreed upon, um, you know, outcome tools and things like the Resuscitation Outcomes Consortium, CARES Registry, the uh, NEMSIS, National EMS Information System, you know, something where we can decide that these are, this is how we're going to define this outcome and this is how we're going to enter it. And that way we know that, you know, we're at least to the best of our ability measuring uh, the same thing. So, I, I mean, I, I, that that's kind of a case for the for these type of uh, registries. And actually, I actually have a question about that. We heard the term epistry versus registry, and we've got a sea of people that, that are learning uh, research and, and all of a sudden they hear these other terms that can be a little confusing. Uh, can you address that, um, either Bill or Dr. Fernando, what, the term epistry versus a registry? We hear trauma registry and CARES registry, and now we're hearing epistry. Any reason for the difference in terminology, or are we talking about the same thing? I would say that there are similarities between the two, but the epistry is, at least the way I understand with ROC, is the way that they collected all patient care data. And it wasn't just a, a cardiac arrest or an AED registry, it was how all the patient information was gathered uh, 
for all of the different rock studies that were done. And they, they went through an entire validation process uh, with it. And it may be the volume of information and I'll have to, I would have to either go back and directly read it, read it, but it is on the rock site that explains in detail the epistry plus several papers that were written about it. Yeah, that's great. Just we're trying not to confuse people, especially as they learn yeah, um, research. So um, just just some of the, the, the terminology in and of itself. Another area uh, that comes up is you started talking about the population of the study and you mentioned a few things about the inclusion criteria. And one of the things I think that kind of bubbled up to the top for me was um, an opportunity to just mention the ethics of biomedical research to uh, our listeners. And in the population, uh, you notice that the inclusion criteria, um, there were some statements about, okay, we wanted, of course, uh, cardiac etiology, because we know that's the, the population that we're interested in here, um, because we know trauma uh, etiologies have a, an entirely different um, determinant of outcome in terms of their care. Uh, and DNR was was in, in there, and that, that of course, is an, another clinically understandable um, exclusion. We don't necessarily want to include uh, patients who would rather not be resuscitated, um, because we know that'll affect the outcome. But uh, there were a few other populations in here. So we have only adults, uh, and we have excluded pregnant patients and prisoners. And for those who are learning research, we know that um, if you ever have the opportunity to actually do an official certification uh, through one of the sites like the city site or um, and learn about the Belmont report and the, and the prior uh, history of um, unethical practices and, and some of the issues surrounding the ethics of biomedical research, these are common po uh, populations of patients that uh, have a special um, protection. So uh, pregnant patients, prisoners, and then pediatric patients. So um, we, and because the outcomes of a pediatric patient as well might might uh, rely on something different than uh, bystander CPR, that might be one of the reasons to exclude uh, and, and put them in the, the population of, uh, a special population in research. So uh, you mentioned also, Bill, the, the Resuscitation Outcomes uh, Consortium, and that you mentioned, and I'm glad you did, about the uh, funding, uh, sunsetting out the funding on the ROC. And I believe they were doing the same thing with the neurologic uh, group, the neurologic um, outcomes research or emergency uh, neurologic research. And there was some discussion of combining them into one larger, uh, newer um, network uh, that would have various hubs and spokes, as they call them, which are essentially hubs would be you know, areas that had, um, that contained a certain personnel and data and uh, and spokes would be different sites essentially that would participate in in research and I'm not sure what the what the state of that is but uh, I know that there was there was some plan to actually combine those but these registries are really important and to do research um, like this uh, one that we're reviewing today um, Dr. Fernando um, we're going to move on did you have any uh, comments about the population uh, that of study and how you came to saying, well, you know, we're going to stick with over 18 and, and, right. uh, mm -hmm. so that those are, those are good points. Um, the large, the, you already mentioned, obviously the ethical concerns surrounding using uh, pregnant patients and prisoners, um, largely the day those are, you know, those patients are not captured in the rock database. So in some ways our inclusion criteria were affected by what's already in the rock database, what inclusion criteria did they use? Um, and so largely that's related to that. The question about, um, not about traumatic versus non-traumatic is, is, is an important question. Um, it's come up, it came up in review of, of this article. Um, and largely, you know, the question is, if you're really just looking at how well people are doing CPR, does it really matter what the etiology of their arrest is? And it's a good question. I, I certainly, as we all know, the outcomes of patients who have not, who have cardiac, of presumed cardiac etiology is significantly better than the patients of traumatic or non-cardiac etiology. And so we wanted to just try and keep things um, as, as, uh, as sort of uniform as possible in terms of that, uh, that outcome. Um, but it, it is a good question that if somebody had a traumatic arrest and you're just purely looking at their quality of CPR that they received, would it really differ? Um, the answer is, is, you know, we don't know. But it, it, the, the reason for that, and as it, as it came up, and a, a number of people asked me, was just for the purposes of maintaining uh, consistency uh, with what we know about the outcomes of uh, cardiac etiology and out-of-hospital cardiac arrest. 
Yeah, I kind of like the way you did it because um, you also are building on another study. You had said that there were um, a study in Denmark that used uh, AEDs for analysis of bystander CPR, but you additionally provided patient outcomes information. And of course, the minute you enter that, you, you're going to have to separate out um, some of the other stuff like trauma. And then you also um, wanted to report latency, I think, to AED analysis and shock delivery. And again, uh, you may not have shock, the, the number of times you'd have a, a, you know, a shock applied in some of these other cases may be fewer. So um, percentages may be affected by that. So uh, let's move then to the uh, figure one, the flow diagram that shows um, the population that ended up, and then we'll bring in Tony. And Tony, you can join us at any time, but we'll, we'll bring you in for the um, to describe the other results. But this looks at your what you ended up analyzing, wh how many cases. So um, we had 4,274 cardiac arrests. And then let's look at these exclusions, because we, we ended up uh, looking only at 100 cases out of these 4,274. And we've got two large groups that are excluded. One is the DNR, which is not surprising, 1,924 non-treated cases. So those are obvious. We're not really going to use those. The, the others, the EMS witness, presumed non-cardiac etiology, were defined automatically. But then you have this no AED applied or used in 1,600 cases, or 1,617. Can you tell us um, what what is that group? These are people that don't have a DNR. They're not trauma cases. They're not witnessed by EMS. But for some reason, we have no AED applied. Do you have any idea whether this was a lack of AED availability or? Uh, are you speaking? To, is that to me or? Yeah, Dr. Fernando, oh, do you have any oh. idea? Oh, it's a, it's a good question. Um, so in the ROC database, there is a, a, a notification of if an AED was used. So these are, uh, and that doesn't specify whether that it was an AED under the jurisdiction of OPS. It's just a yes, no, was an AED used. Uh, these cases, uh, from my understanding, are, as you stated, are cases that an AED was not applied uh, in out-of-hospital cardiac arrest. Okay. So that brings us down to eligibility of 148. Um, patients and then excluded because there was no file. Uh, there was 45 that were excluded because of no file. Maybe that gets to what um, Bill was talking about earlier, the kind of uh, logistics of, of doing this kind of thing. Um, and for some reason, there's no file for 45 of those cases. W eligible cases with AED available uh, data is 103. And then, then we had a definition of less than one minute of CPR data available um, of, of three of those, which is well, not that many at all. And then we end up with 100 analyzed cases. So uh, were you surprised at this? Were you surprised at the, the number of exclusions or, the, or what you ended up with? Yeah, I think in, in some ways we were. Um, obviously, you're hoping there would be more uh, cases that had an AED, as that was the only way of us uh, extracting the data. So when we originally had 148, we, we assumed that actually the large number of them would have uh, the data, which was which was the case. But to lose 45 because there wasn't a corresponding AED file was uh, was a little bit disappointing, obviously. Yeah. Um, the, the less than one minute CPR, as we spoke about the reasons for why we did that, and, and I think ultimately we didn't lose a lot from that. But uh, yeah, it, it speaks to, to what Dr. Toon is talking about. There is a lot of logistics involved, and and uh, you know I don't really have a good explanation for why those 45 cases didn't uh, didn't have data that was available. I mean, maybe uh, you know the AED didn't record, maybe it wasn't turned on properly, et cetera, et cetera. Because as I said in the ROC database, we only have a sort of yes, no, was an AED used, um, mm -hmm. and so uh, you know it doesn't specify what type of AED it is, and it doesn't specify. Uh, because it might have been a, a private AED, right? That's not under the, the auspices of the OPS. And um, so there's a number of possible reasons not for sure. why we didn't, yeah, we didn't we didn't tease it out, but uh, it, you know, we were hoping at least more of them uh, would be involved. But uh, I think ultimately we were happy with the, the number that we had. Yeah, I yeah. think so too. And actually when you go back to the research question and say, if you were just asking a group of people, what's the quality of CPRs performed by bystanders during the course of an out of hospital cardiac arrest? And you went you know, from the ground up and designed, you'd be happy to have a hundred cases where you could actually look at those. Bill, do you have something? Yeah, I was going to add two things uh, to what you just said there. Uh, one is first about the uh, the AD and uh, the, he touched on all of the things that are there and it was amazing sometimes uh, not to have software available to download the particular model of an AED. 
some, you know, not everyone, not all the big manufacturers um, make AEDs. Uh, so when you get to these smaller uh, AED manufacturers, they often don't have any way to download any of the data for clinical use. Yeah. They do have it for their engineering purposes, and sometimes you would have to physically return an AED to have them um, go through it. And we had a case once where we did that, the AED had to go back to Ireland. And uh, so that just adds a level of complexity that's, uh, to collecting it. So it really takes... Um, I have to tell you that's for 10 years, that's what I did. So I learned a lot of tricks on how to get that information, but there, there was still just some data that you just couldn't get. The other thing I wanted that you mentioned is about uh, bystander quality or anyone's quality. I don't think you can look at someone performing chest compressions and say they're doing it right or not by just mm -hmm. observation. And it's often when we started using instrumented mannequins and they started getting feedback, you know, they, we would blind them to the feedback until they were over and then print out a recording and they would just be amazed that they thought they had been doing such a better job and everyone around them thought they were doing a good job. And it just shows that we did not have the ability through observation to say that the CPR quality was good or not. Yeah, that's a great point, and we're kind of a competitive bunch, so if you ever go to any of the conferences that you can see, you know, at least a dozen different uh, booths out there with little competitions going on about who can do the best quality CPR on these mannequins, so um, yeah, I, I, I would completely agree with you on that. Uh, let's bring in Tony um, Fernandez. Uh, Dr. Fernandez, can you come in and, uh, and carry us through uh, some of these really fascinating results? Absolutely. And I, again, I just want to congratulate the author on a, a great study. Um, and as Dr. Toon just mentioned, uh, when the authors were looking at uh, quality CPR as their outcome measure, they didn't actually just look at it as this nebulous um, uh, idea of quality. They had some outcome measures. And um, before we get into the results, I want to uh, talk about what their specific outcome measures were. Um, so first, they looked at the proportion of time spent providing chest compressions during the, resusc the resuscitation efforts. Um, this is the, the chest compression fraction. Uh, they looked at the average compression rate, the average compression depth. They looked at the average peri-shock pause. Um, and this is, the, this is the sum of the pre-shock pause, or the time between stopping chest compressions and delivering a shock and the post-shock pause, which is the time from shock delivery to resuming chest compressions. Um, so they looked at what that, what that measure was, um, and they compared it across. They also looked at um, the measures, they measured adherence to the 2010 and the 2015 uh, AHA guidelines. Um, they did this because the study crossed over both of those guidelines. Um, the study period was from July 2010 to uh, July 2016, and they were able to get, as we talked about, uh, 100 cases, um, which met their uh, inclusion exclusion criteria. Um, now, one of the things that folks will worry about when you lose a lot of data, um, as they did, and justifiably so, um, they, they, I think that they certainly, uh, their inclusion exclusion criteria certainly led to the most appropriate study population. However, one thing that um, you, you always want to do, and the authors did a great job of, was looking at if there was any meaningful differences between the, pa the patients who had data and the, those where data were missing, and um, they didn't find any meaningful differences there, um, which was, was great going forward. Um, there also were uh, about 79 cases where the AED was used by a, an off-duty police officer. Um, as we uh, Dr. Toon mentioned earlier the, the definition of a bystander can include off-duty police officers, EMS workers, um, firefighters, and the like. Um, there were 79 cases out of the 100 that where the AED was used by an off-duty police officer and 21 where it was used by the general public. And uh, uh, interestingly, there was no difference uh, when they compared the CPR quality for police officers and the general public. Um, Overall, the average chest compression fraction was about 76%. Uh, the average depth was about 5.3 centimeters, and the average chest compress the average compression rate was 111.2 compressions per minute. So, um, uh, overall, it looks like folks are doing pretty well. 
Um, we also, the authors also noted that the bystanders performed better um, when they looked at assessments based on the 2010 AHA guidelines versus the 2015. And that sort of makes makes sense. You can pass the test of the sniff test there since the study ended in 2016 and uh, we're talking about 2010 versus 2015 um, guidelines. You would think that it would take some time uh, to get used to the new guidelines. Um, but when evaluating the 2010 guidelines, they had about 66% adherence uh, to the recommended rate of 100 compressions per minute. Uh, about 55% adhere to the recommended depth um, of greater than five centimeters and about 41% adhere to both the recommended rate and depth. Um, when they were assessing adherence to the 2015 guidelines, 50% adhered to the recommended compression rate. Um, that was between 110 and 120 uh, compressions per minute. 29% adhered to the recommended compression depth of five to six centimeters. 29% that is, excuse me. And 16% adhered to both the rate and depth recommendations. And the average peri shock pause was about 27 seconds, so that's under 30 seconds. So um, on the face of it, these, 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 it looks like these bystanders, they're, they're, they're doing a pretty pretty strong work um, in providing CPR uh, before care is taken over. Um, there were some really interesting things that we found, that the authors found um, that we read about here that I want to make note of. Uh, first and foremost, I think it was very interesting that, um, and that if we can go back one slide, I think, uh, those 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 line those uh, line graphs really help. Um, oh yeah, the one where it shows this. the first minute. Yeah. Yeah. So the, the, those the authors are really noted that the performance was worse for the first for the first minute of the resuscitation, um, but it improved across the board the second minute and remained consistent for the final four minutes. Um, and you can see that by those those first three graphs on on the right hand side. Um, <clears throat> the authors had had some uh, great ideas as to why this might be. Um, first, they noted that uh, it took about 40 seconds to analyze the rhythm, um, and it took, uh, I'm sorry, it, it took about 40 seconds uh, to turn on the AED and to have analy analyze the rhythm was an additional uh, uh, 10 seconds. So it was um, there was there was quite a bit that that could have in been included in why this first minute was was not as optimal as the other four. Um, they also noted that there's diff the bystanders may have some difficulty estimating measures, and um, when they first get on the chest, they may uh, have some fear of causing additional harm. Um, you know, Tony, we have a related question here too. Uh, sorry yeah. to interrupt, but Tom no, actually please. is asking us in our uh, little chat area here. Um, did this type of AED provide direct feedback to the CPR provider? So in other words, when they start in that first minute, um, does this, the actual AED say, you know, compress deeper or uh, does it have a, you know, a scale or something on it? So Dr. Fernando, do you, um, do you know, did it provide like a verbal feedback or? A yeah, that's, so that's, an, that's an outstanding question. Uh, the answer is yes. Um, the feedback, the uh, AEDs that were utilized, the Zola AEDs that are utilized, do provide feedback. Um, and uh, we can actually see uh, when we download the data where and at what points. Um, and absolutely, if the uh, rescuer is not performing at the correct rate or depth, it will be advised by the, uh, by the defibrillator or the AED rather to, uh, you know, push harder or push faster uh, until the, the desired rate is achieved. There is a significant amount of evidence showing that uh, the use of feedback technology in AEDs does improve CPR quality. It doesn't improve mm -hmm. patient outcomes. There's no evidence that it improves outcomes, but that is a very important point uh, that we were we did mention, I believe, in the in the study. Yeah, great. We also have one more question, and then I'll let you continue, Tony. Um, this is from Brian Haskins from Monash University in Melbourne, Australia. Brian, what time is it there? Um, but welcome. Thanks for uh, sending your question. Did the authors know the level of CPR training for the bystanders um, delivering CPR? If so, did training increase the quality of bystander CPR? So, so uh, another another uh, fantastic uh, question. Um, the answer is uh, for the large majority of them, uh, we do because they were police officers. Um, so we know the training uh, that police officers achieve with the Ottawa Police Services is just uh, basic uh, life saving. So they don't they don't have any ACLS training or any advanced care or anything like that, that as our paramedics would would receive. 
Um, but uh, in terms of the other, uh, the other 20 or so cases, we don't know. Now, um, that's not the, the ROC database is a de-identified database. I, we don't know anything about the names or of these patients. And, and so we know obviously even less about the rescuers who are involved. Uh, there is a lot of data to suggest that uh, patients who were uh, more, um, patients who are, are, are more likely to utilize an AED, or rescuers rather, more likely to use an AED at the site of a cardiac arrest are more likely to have some level of, of basic life-saving skills. And I, I think that that's a reasonable thing to assume, but uh, unfortunately we don't know for sure in, in those non-police cases of, uh, of AED uh, application. Yeah, great point. And Tom follows up with uh, just saying that either maybe the rationale for improvement is that feedback, and I think I think uh, that's a, a great point. And thanks Absolutely. again for Brian for joining us at 3.40 a.m. <laughs> in Melbourne, Australia. That's dedication. Uh, Megan, and I was just going to... I was yeah. just going to add in there is we had also attempted to with our through our battalion chiefs on scene to get collect information you know from bystanders as much as possible we always tried to at least catch their name and their um and a, a contact information so we could follow up with them uh later and i and i can tell you the majority of them had received some kind of cpr training at least in our system uh, not necessarily through us, but prior to their episode. Yeah, and you know, before Tony, um, I'm going to ask Tony to continue with the um, results. The one thing that actually really stood out to me, I teach a lot of CPR, and the thing I find the most frustrating is in these trainer models, um, the, the, is that pre-shock pause, um, and that's I'm not surprised that in Table Three you saw that that uh, the peri-shock pause being the product of the two pre and post shock pause the pre shock pause accounts for the majority of it and that's not surprising to me because every time we train uh, the AED says the same thing right apply pads to the patient's bare chest plug in pads connectors and then it says analyzing shock um, heart rhythm do not touch the patient and so they don't touch the patient then they're waiting and waiting and it says you know, shock advised, stay clear of patients. So they're still staying clear. And you know, no matter how many times I tell them, you know, while it's charging, you can continue. They're listening to that voice very, you know, very carefully. So when they hear don't touch, they're not going to touch. And that pre-shock pause is a long time when you're teaching CPR. So um, I'm not surprised at that. And that the area there and it and I think the authors bring it up in the end it's an important area for improvement in AED design and then uh, prompting bystanders to begin chest compressions immediately and continue them even when there's a shock advised uh, so anyway I, I, Dr. Fernandez can you continue with your um, uh, looking at the uh, results of the study yeah absolutely um, I, I think we're, we're we're wrapping up um, uh, with with the all the interesting results that they found uh, they they did find that um, about 46% of patients had returned to spontaneous circulation um, with EMS. Um, uh, there, that was 39% at arrival on the emergency department. And one of the most interesting things I think about this paper is they, they were able to get outcome data, which is so hard um, in a lot of studies. So 42% uh, of the, the population, so that was 42 of the 100, um, they survived. and they didn't, the authors didn't just look at survival, they looked at uh, what is called a modified ranking score. Uh, ranking score, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna let someone who's better at pronouncing things make sure that I pronounce that correctly, but um, this is essentially a measure of the degree of disability uh, due to uh, cardiac arrest, and it measures everything from no symptoms uh, to severe disability to death. Um, and the folks in this study, um, uh, had a ranking score of about 3.7 and just for context um, if you have no symptoms that's a that would be a zero um, and dead dead would be a six so um, they're about 3.7 which uh, for which is, is an interesting result in and of itself um, a lot of folks might choose just to write a paper on that uh, so I thought that um, that the authors did a great job on this paper and the results were uh, really interesting and well done so again congratulations to the authors yeah i also want to congratulate them for uh, i believe you said one of the authors stanley was a, is a paramedic um who uh, actually had come up with the idea i want everybody out there who's listening um again being involved in uh, research is 
uh, sometimes begins with your idea. You're the ones uh, out there carrying out these protocols and, and uh, carrying out the care of the patient in the field. So uh, being involved in this kind of research is, is, um, is your responsibility, really. Uh, I have a quick question about these kiosks. Have people seen the kiosks out there with the uh, CPR? Um, you know, essentially, it's like an ATM machine, <laughs> except with a, a CPR um, mannequin and and quality CPR. Are you guys familiar with those? Do you, do you see those uh, around Ontario as well, Dr. Fernando? Uh, I believe they're starting to put them in uh, some airports now, um, but I haven't I haven't personally run across any yet. I'm sure they're I'm sure they're working on it. Yeah, yeah oh yeah, I did never pass one up without trying. Oh, I have I haven't tried one yet. I'm heading to the Are airport. Are you embarrassed? Later. I'll have to look. No, I've never seen one. I've still only seen pictures. So now I have to uh, head to the airport and and check one out. But I do. We do have a, our public member of our advisory committee would like to have it uh, on on our campuses. They would like to actually have them on a at a variety of different locations and schools and and that kind of thing and start them young, which I think is a a pretty good idea. I'm hoping the uh, Heart Association, who I believe are the sponsors of these things, would, uh, they do collect data. You know, they don't know who the person is, but there is information about the quality because at the end it gives you feedback about your compression rate and depth and release and stuff. So it'd be interesting to see um, how many people do it. I do hope they're collecting data on these devices and can report on it. Yeah, that's a, a really good idea. The other thing is adding the AED component to it. Um, you know, is there something to practice the AED? And then, uh, you know, the other thing is, I, I still can't get beyond that one minute, that first minute of, of um, you know, when it, it doesn't, again, it doesn't really surprise me that that first minute uh, isn't, wasn't the, the, the best timing. That's the first minute of any call usually is you have to settle in, but I think, it, the interesting part about that is the whole idea of providing specific targeted feedback. Um, and through the AED, uh, I, I have to say that the students do listen to that AED, especially when you're teaching layperson um, CPR or even healthcare provider to new healthcare providers um, who are from all walks. They're not necessarily going to be responders to cardiac arrest. They might be responders, you know, on the street. They may be the layperson. Um, but that that pre-shock pause is very frustrating um, as you're trying to tell them, no, 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 you can go ahead and continue CPR while while this thing is is charging, and it, it, they, you know, there's this fear of of uh, of being shocked. So, uh, and and of listening to this device saying, do not touch the patient. So, I think you that's... you bring up an excellent point, and uh, one of the things that's very interesting is when you can match a video recording often security surveillance stuff with uh, the people doing CPR along with AED process data and stuff. And we we had some cases where we were able to do that. It was fascinating to watch the call progress. And I think you touched on it. I think that first minute for anyone, even professionally trained providers, is figuring out the logistics of everything and getting stuff going, but for the layperson that doesn't have the repeated practice and everything, I'm not surprised by that at all. I thought it was great though that after a minute that how it began to just even out and they really performed so well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a really good point. We have, let's see, a comment from Lynn. Um, providing students with landmarks. I'm not sure exactly what the question is or comment, um, but she does bring up uh, something like uh, fears, um, like breaking ribs, uh, patient vomiting, um, things like that are there. Uh, you know, that I know that always came up as, you know, I mentioned in the very beginning that when I started and, and Bill, I'd love to hear what, how, what you can remember from when you started as well, because I don't know how, how close we are in age, but um, it was, like I said, it was five to one. I'm pretty sure it was five to one chest compressions to ventilations. And the emphasis was heavily on, on ventilations, on mouth to mouth and, and response times and getting there fast. And, and we were just starting to talk about putting, um, AEDs or, or actually defibrillators, I don't think they were called AEDs, on uh, first response units. Uh, it, it wasn't even really, fire service wasn't really responsive in our, in our area, um, responding to uh, emergencies, uh, medical emergencies at that point. And, and the emphasis was on, on, on the airway. 
it, but it, it was much different. It was, I can tell you that, uh, it, first of all, it was 1975 when I got my mm -hmm. first CPR <laughs> certification. And then so that you were time, the first. <laughs> yeah, no, but I was the first set of guidelines. Uh, yeah. The, um, it was a much slower rate too. It was a rate of uh, oh, 60. That's right. The compression rate was 60 and that was the total amount of time, including breaths that had to be, you did four stair step breaths at the beginning and it was a full 10 seconds of a pulse check. It was a very uh, elongated process at the beginning to compare to what we now have with chest compression only. But something that you brought up about fears, I think that there's been some nice papers written out of the Seattle project where they've looked at injuries and some other people have done it too. And the, the and this is particularly in cases of teaching people to, to just do chest compressions with agonal respirations, or if you think someone's breathing, is that the, the severity of the injuries appear to be very low, that there doesn't appear to be uh, a fatal harm. It, the harm comes by not doing something. Mm -hmm. You know, when someone needs chest compressions versus if someone has a pulse and you're doing chest compressions, it's, it's sort of like better to be doing something than um, not doing something. The other thing that we saw that was very interesting is, is that when we switched to the chest compression only, we saw a lot less uh, regurgitation issues because when you had people doing mouth to mouth, they often weren't doing it well. And a lot of stuff was going into the stomach and descending it and, and that led to the vomiting. But when we went to uh, you know, chest compression only, we saw a dramatic decline in the amount of emesis present upon EMS arrival, because we care, we had a separate registry uh, for our airway ma maintenance when we when I was working, and uh, we gained a lot of information about the presence of emesis or not during advanced airway management. Yeah, what a great point. Um, you know, the other thing that was raised here uh, in the paper briefly, right at the beginning, was um, we can't forget that some communities uh, have show a. a really low uh, bystander CPR rates, you know, as low as 10% and maybe even lower. And that there have been disparities um, across, uh, you know, income levels in particular. But, you know, we've seen this kind of um, discussion about disparities in treatments and application of treatments and STEMI and, and identification of different uh, conditions like STEMIs and, and uh, strokes. Uh, and we've talked about that here, um, but we also have this issue of bystander CPR uh, and a application of bystander CPR that's different among different communities and the need for education. Uh, and, and some of it relates to what you're talking about, safety and, and um, maybe myths about what, what may happen if they do apply treatment. So uh, that, that's another thing that can come out of, of large registry uh, type data like this. Um, and, and now I think this really adds to some of the detail about, yeah, bystanders are actually, you know, in this population at least, and, and, and we can show that the, the quality uh, CPR can be applied. And, you know, wh whether or not we want to say, that we can't say much about the outcomes, I I'm sorry, but 46%, I, I think that's significant enough, enough for us to say, wow, you know, we're talking about, uh, a significant um, number there, 46% um, survival. That, that's that's a, a pretty big number. So um, this has been a, a really important uh, piece of work that I think um, should carry forward. And one of the questions that I have too, and this is really for, I think, Tony Fernandez, our, our epidemiologist, when you have uh, terms like, um, we have definitions here of data points like peri uh, shock. I think it was perishock interval um, and uh, pre, oh, perishock pause, uh, pre-shock pause and post-shock pause. Uh, are these new terms? And actually, um, uh, Shannon Fernando, Dr. Fernando, you can also address this too. Are these new terms that you have now um, are using here, uh, or is this are these definitions that have been taken from uh, you know other research? Right. Um, so with regards to the perishock pause, um, the original uh, application, I believe, of that term uh, is a paper that we, we cited um, it, from 2011 in circulation by Dr. Sheldon Cheskis uh, at uh, the University of Toronto, who's a well-known uh, out-of-hospital cardiac arrest researcher. Um, so he, uh, that paper was really the first one to demonstrate uh, the, uh, the, the, how the perishock pause predicts survival from out-of-hospital uh, cardiac arrest. 
Um, and so since then, that has sort of become uh, sort of almost required on, on these studies of reporting CPR quality to know uh, what the perishock pause is. But it, it, the term was originally, I believe, coined in that 2011 paper. And I'm just trying to look at it right now. Uh, it's uh, reference 18 in the paper by, by Dr. Cheskis uh, in circulation in 2011. Okay, great. And that's uh, the reason I bring that up is um, when we talk about continuing and ba basing for future research on something, um, again, it would be nice to, to say, I, I mean, I think those are, are great terms and great definitions, and that would be something to carry forward and say, we know we want to look at these things, these very same things, but maybe in my community, I want to look at the differences in different communities. Maybe I want to look at you know, pre-shock pause and post-shock pause, peri-shock pause and, and quality using these same criteria, but in my own community. And, and this time I want to compare, you know, by um, income levels or by whatever, um, you know, age groups or something. Uh, but you can use the same outcomes. And I think that's important for our listeners who are learning about research to, you know, um, you try to utilize something that, that so that you're, you can compare results among, among other studies. And Megan, just I know that we're getting towards the very end here, but there's a mm -hmm. one of the advantage though is of actually going after the AED data for a system to make that, you know, just part of their thing is not only the valuable information it can provide to the cardiologist that talks about what rhythm was present and will it mean the difference between an implanted device or not, or how they'll manage them in the long run. I think that that's essential. The other piece I think that's very important is are the AEDs doing what we're supposed to do? And if you're not collecting that data, you won't know if an AED failed or didn't fail or what. And again, I was involved in another case where the AED was so designed that uh, the bystander, instead of delivering a shock, actually kept turning the device off. And uh, after that case was thoroughly evaluated, the manufacturer made some changes to their device based upon it. It was one of the more off-brand devices. So I think it's a, it's an absolutely essential that um, we police them. We can't, I, I think it's always a mistake to assume these medical devices are performing as the salesman tells you they will. Yeah. <laughs> I've always been very skeptical of that. What that a great many, point. Many salesmen don't like talking to me. <laughs> Well, next time I'm buying a television, I want to bring you with me. Uh, that, that's a really great point. Um, just an, an excellent point about uh, quality. Did you uh, have anything to add to that, Dr. Fernando? No, I, I, I agree with, uh, with everything Dr. Jude said. I think, uh, you know, we, the, the beauty of our system, or the system we utilize in this study is we can see every compression that was done. Um, it, it comes up as kind of like a vertical point on the, on the software. So we can see every single you know, rocking of that uh, accelerometer. Um, but it is true that, uh, and that was one of the benefits of using a consistent AED across all of this, all of the, the involved patients. But, but certainly, uh, you know, different, you, different centers have different, uh, different technology and they may not all uh, perform in the same way or perform correctly at all. So uh, it is a very good point. Yeah, and it's, it, it, it is a great point. And it, it means driving the technology through clinical outcomes, not the opposite. So um, I think when the more we're together on on the things that are important based upon uh, evidence, uh, the more that we can drive the way that uh, things should be measured. And I, I completely agree with Dr. Toon. Policing is a, a good term. Um, we're approaching uh, the end here. We only have one more minute left. So um, let me just, uh, first of all, say thank you very much uh, for joining us. Let me ask if um, Dr. Fernandez and uh, Dr. Toon, do either of you have any final comments? I don't. This is this is Tony here. I, I just want to reiterate, great study, uh, strong work by the authors, and uh, thanks for joining us today. Yes, thank you very much. I appreciate it. It was wonderful to have you on, and I always just appreciate having the authors because they bring such great insight to their, uh, their work, and thank you for doing it, and particularly thank the uh, advanced care paramedic that was involved in yes. the process there. Yeah, thank you all for joining us. And um, uh, Dr. Shannon Fernando from uh, Canada, thank you very much for uh, joining us today and adding so much depth to our uh, journal club today. And uh, to all of you out there, listeners, thank you for joining us, especially in this beautiful summer month. Um, Please join us next month, and if you'd like to present an upcoming article, you can email David Page at dpage at emsed.net. 
That's dpage at emsed.net. See you next month.